Hi guys, my name is Dennis. Thanks for joining. My wife wanted to purchase a dresser and I looked at that as an opportunity to build one. I found plans for a traditional shaker dresser on the Epic Woodwork site with Tom McLaughlin and it looked like just what she wanted. I thought, it can't be that hard, right? Well, when it said traditional shaker dresser, I should have known better. It had a lot of interesting techniques, but I had never done them before. Through dovetails, half blind dovetails, sliding dovetails, and more. Stay tuned and I'll take you through my journey. Now the plans call for joining the top, bottom, and sides with half blind dovetails, seven at each corner for a total of 28. I decided to cut these dovetails by hand. I was not skilled at the process, but I watched a lot of videos, practiced a lot, and the result was that they were acceptable. They weren't perfect, but they were acceptable. To give me a better chance at success, I purchased the dovetail guide you see me using here from Jonathan Katz Moses. And I have to say that that worked very well. It's critical to get a nice straight line across the edge of the board. And this guide really did a nice job of helping me do that. I'm cutting the tails first and removing most of the waste with a fret saw and then removing the remaining waste to the cut line with a chisel. Now most people would say cutting the tails is the easy part, but cutting and fitting the pins is another story. Here's a technique I picked up from watching Mike Pekovich, and that is lining the edge of the pin board with painter's tape to provide better visibility to the scribe lines when cutting the pins. And you have to be careful with half blind dovetails since you're only partially cutting the pin board and you're cutting at an angle. And since you are cutting at an angle, there's a lot of wood in the cut line that remains and needs to be cut out. And you can't do that with a saw. So here's a tool I picked up from Rob Cosman, which is basically a card scraper with a handle, and it allows you to sever the wood that you were unable to cut with the handsaw. And based on Rob's recommendations, I'm using the tool to incrementally sever those fibers in each saw curve versus trying to sever those fibers in one big swoop. And that's gonna help avoid splitting the wood. Now I'm being a little bit more careful with the end pins as opposed to the interior pins as the end pins are more prone to splitting. The method I used to remove the waste was another method from Rob Cosman and the key here was not to chisel away the waste at the edge at full depth as there be no support as you move closer to the cut line. So start by chiseling down about a third of the way and as you reach the midway point start to cut to full depth and mark your chisel either with tape or a marker to control the depth of cut. And you want to just keep going until you get to the point where you're just beyond that knife line, maybe a 30 second. Insert your chisel right in that knife line, give it a little bit of a backward angle, and drive your chisel right down for a nice clean cut. And now I'm standing the piece up vertically and using a slicing motion to remove waste from the bottom, using a chisel to do a little bit more cleanup, and then using a router plane to give me a nice flat surface. So after all the dovetails were cut, I wanted to bring together all four sides and do a nice dry fit to see and make sure that everything is aligned properly and fit properly, and if not, to make any adjustments where necessary. I also want to check for square. This, is good. Uh, this box is going to be the foundation for the rest of the build. I want to make sure it's square, and if not, I want to uh, resolve any issues now as opposed to trying to deal with them later on. Now the plans call for sliding dovetails for the draw dividers and cutting them was much easier to do with the box broken down as opposed to it being assembled. I used a router to cut the dovetails into the case size and used a makeshift router table made up of just a piece of plywood and a 2x4 to cut the pins. And this was really a trial and error process in order to get a good fit, but in the end the results came out pretty good. The drawer dividers were just part of the interior components. I also needed to make drawer runners, which, along with the drawer dividers, needed a groove to accommodate the dust panels for each drawer. And the drawer runners had to be configured with mortise and tenon joinery to allow wood movement. So this gave me an opportunity to use some hand tools, which I really like using. It took a little longer, but it's a lot less noisy and no need for all the protective equipment. Tenons front and back are completely loose and I know in this case others would glue the front tenon to promote wood movement to the rear of the case. Here Tom was of the opinion that the screws had give and that the screws were close enough to each other that they would not impact wood movement. In addition they would also lend themselves to replacement should the need ever occur. Not that I expect this piece to be passed down for generations but I am curious how this holds up over my lifetime. And here's a completed view of the interior components of the case.
You know, as I mentioned before, the case rests on a base, and the base has through dovetail joinery at each of the corners. And here you can see that I'm starting to get away from the dovetail guide and cutting the pins and tails freehand. And I moved away from the fret saw as well, at least temporarily, to remove the waste. And we'll see how that goes over the longer term. I happen to see Chris Bexford chop out waste very quickly with a chisel, and I decided to try it. And so far, I like it. Each of the sides has a curved cutout, and so I made a template from the plans, and I'm scribing the template to each of the sides, and then I took each of the sides over to the bandsaw to rough cut to the outline. I cleaned up each of the curves with a spoke shave and sandpaper and began the glue up process, which went very well considering how glue ups go. I checked the base for equal diagonals, made some adjustments where necessary, and let the assembly dry. Here I'm just taking out some time to clean up the base. Since this is a natural wood project using poplar, we have to be concerned with wood movement. You saw that when I talked about the draw slides, and that's a concern with the base and carcass as well. The carcass is going to move, and for all intents and purposes, the base is not. So we have to allow for that movement when connecting the base to the carcass. Now the front of the case is facing you, and the three glue blocks in the front and the one on each side, left and right, will be glued to the bottom of the carcass and the inside front of the base. The remaining glue blocks that you see will only be glued to the inside base and only screwed to the bottom of the carcass, no glue. You'll see that each of those glue blocks that will be screwed to the bottom of the carcass has an elongated washer and the wood below that washer mirrors that opening in the washer. That's where the screw is going to go. So that when the bottom of the carcass decides to move towards the back, the screw and the way it and the glue block is applied will allow it to move without splitting. Here I fastened all the glue blocks to the inside of the base. So here's where we are right now. I've attached the carcass to the base. Uh, the interior is pretty much done as far as the major components and it's really starting to take shape now. So here's a close-up of the through dovetails on the base and uh, I was happy the way these turned out. They look nice and crisp. And above that, you can see the molding that surrounds the um, chest on three sides. And this was done later on in the process, and I cut these on a router table. But just to mention again around wood movement, the molding is glued to the carcass and the base in the front. But on the sides, it's only glued to the carcass and the base for about six inches towards the front. Beyond that, it's only glued to the base. And that's again to allow wood movement towards the rear of the chest. And when I refer to wood movement, it's the movement of the carcass, not of the base. The drawers were a challenge, and I made a separate video on how I built the drawers, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. The challenge here is that you want a very snug fit, while at the same time being able to push the drawer in and pull it out effortlessly, with an even reveal around the entire drawer. The drawers are solid wood, half-blind dovetails in the front, through dovetails in the rear, the bottom is oriented in such a way that it promotes wood movement towards the rear of the case. If you're interested in the minute details of how I built it, check out the video. I think you'll enjoy it. Now this is a paint grade project, which is why I'm doing it in Poplar. It needs to match, or the exterior needs to match the color of the other furniture in the room. So I'm giving a coat of shellac to all the unseen pieces, uh, the underside, the inside of the carcass, the top of the subtop, as well as the drawers with the exception of the draw faces. So offline I dimensioned the top. This will be the actual top that goes on top of the carcass. I'm giving it some final planing and I'll do some sanding as well. And eventually I'll pass it through my router with a bullnose bit for the front and the two sides. And here's a quick look at what the top looks like when it's installed. I installed it from the underside using screws. One of the last steps was creating draw stops. And for that, we created small wafer-like wood strips and lined the front with leather in order to soften the blow when closing the drawer and fasten them to the drawer dividers. Here you also see what I use for the back of the carcass. That's half inch poplar, tongue and groove, attached with screws, top and bottom. Next step was to finally install the draw knobs, and for that I used a cabinet hardware jig from True Position Tools, and that made really quick and accurate work of the installation. I've used other jigs in the past, but this tool was above and beyond those, so if you have a lot of cabinet work that you might be doing, 
this is definitely worth a look. And here's the final product. We used a combination of paints to get to this color so that it matches other furniture in the room. And we used a darker wax to give it those, uh, those darker accents that you see as well. I'll leave a link to the um, Epic Woodworking website where you can purchase the plans. He in no way is sponsoring this, um, uh, this video. I purchased the plans on my own with my own money along with the accompanying videos and I got to say that they were great. So if you're interested in building something like this with some direction, I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, what he has to offer. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.